Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Angel Road Outdoors. I am joined this week for episode 16 um, with Justin Sinan of the Running and Gunning podcast. Um, he is somebody that I reached out to on multiple occasions just randomly uh, because he seemed approachable um, for just some to answer some questions about some things that I'd been pondering as I moved into my mobile hunting uh, my mobile hunting season. Uh, that's kind of what I'm calling the era that I'm in now. Uh, Justin is the host of the Running and Gunning podcast. He is affiliated with Lone Wolf Custom Gear as well, and um, he definitely knows his stuff. It's really cool to talk with him and hear his evolution as a hunter, um, starting over on the East Coast in Maryland and moving it, uh, you know, to the uh, upper Midwest per se uh, in Kentucky. And uh, just just his evolution as a person and a hunter and how he um, utilizes woodsmanship as his number one tool in his arsenal. And I think it's a huge lesson for everybody. And I really appreciate his time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We appreciate your time. Enjoy this conversation with Justin. Coming up now. I don't know. I wouldn't say that I'm... I frequently have people on Zoom, but I have done it in the past, but then I took a huge break. And so coming back to it was relearning yeah. everything. I got everything. You. Yeah, this will be my first actual like Zoom record. Uh, so it's kind of nice to have other options. So yeah. I'm learning too. Well, you know what's awesome? For whatever it's worth, have you ever decided to record video? Your freaking video is 10 times clearer than mine and my computer is right in front of my face. Okay. So I don't know if you yeah, got I mean, a fantastic laptop or whatever it is, I, but whatever it is. I working. got a new laptop, but uh, yeah, it's it's weird because on my end, it shows up like I'm a little bit blurry, but up top, it looks clear as shit. So. Good. Nice. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Man. All the all the boys are still decorated here. I see like that. A little, Good for you. little view of the trophy room down in here. I went for a hike last night and um, realized that most of my neighbors still have their Christmas decorations and tree still up. Uh, yeah. but my wife is like, that shit's got to go as soon as new year's like that's just gone. <laughs> I know. Nah, my, my wife, uh, had that feeling until yesterday and she's like, all right, I'm done. She had enough. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, I guess so. I guess it's time to wrap shit up. That's funny. Like, so I don't dude, even think about um, it. Where I met you at one of the shows, didn't I? Well, I doubt it unless you came to Michigan. No, no I didn't come to Michigan. I met so many new people this year. It was like hard to keep track of. I, was, I did too this year at, at uh, the Michigan show, but the first year I went, I was, I just, my brother and I hung out, but this year we were more like shaking hands and talking to people, which was really cool. Yeah. Do you Is go to any other shows? Good. Oh yeah. It's perfect. Is it? Okay, cool. Cool. Do you um, just, which one did you go to the Pennsylvania one? Uh, so I went to the Pennsylvania um, outdoor show, uh, the great American outdoor show. I went to um, the Mobile Hunter Expo in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I went to the Mobile Hunter Roadshow in Virginia, Nashville, uh, Iowa, and I did the Illinois uh, Deer Classic. Nice. Man, that's busy. Yeah, it was, it was a freaking busy year. <laughs> Were you? So just so you know, I am recording this, by the way. Okay. Um, so if you say something and you don't want that in there, I can, I'll can i happily cut it out. You just never oh, know no, when no. there's going to be a really good nugget uh, during conversation. Yeah. So I just hit. Anyway, oh, are you are you obligated to go to that many shows with, with your affiliation? No. No, no. I'm not. Um, I kind of did it uh, this past year for more exposure for the podcast. Yeah. And um, I was really lucky with like my job. It really, I just wasn't that busy. Uh, I had my own business. Um, I mean, there was just a, a lot of low times, like when it was colder. So yeah, I just, you know, the wife was cool with it and, uh, I went and helped out at some of the shows and it's always good for me. I go to, so I grew up in Maryland, like on the East coast and I go out there to catch up with my friends at the PA show. Uh, a lot of, I have a lot of people come in family and stuff and they'll come hang out at the booth and we'll kick it for a little while. And that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to tone it down though this year. I'm not doing quite as many shows, I don't think. Are, are you encouraged to tone it down this year from the home front or is that just a, internally you know you need to tone it down a little bit? I think both, honestly. Yeah. Like my my wife's a saint. Um she won't like 
she never like comes out as like you're not gonna go to this or right. you're not gonna she never demands it. it's more it's more like personal guilt you know sure. and you it's can like, feel it yeah realistically like i'd rather uh save my time away from the family for hunting trips versus sure. just just going to a a booth and standing there and it's not like there's there's sometimes like I'll make a little bit of money from doing a show, but generally like when you look at the grand scheme of things, like you're, you know, it's just a little bit of extra money for your time, but it's not right. Nobody out there is making a living doing that shit. Except sure. for, uh, except for Rendell, uh, Rendell Eric. He's, <laughs> he's, he's making money from the show. Good circuit, for him. Good for him. The dude's, the dude's got, he's stressed too. So I'm I mean, sure, you know, it, uh, I'm sure it's a lot. I think he's doing like 20 shows this year for us. Oh so, my so. God. Yes. Yeah. So but I, I guess mean, that's I'm your kidding. gig. That's your gig. Yeah. You know, and, and Cody, uh, Cody DeQuisto reached out to me about like trying to do something like that with the show circuit because I helped them a lot. And right. like, he knew I was, you know, flexible with my time. And he's like, dude, if you want to, but I'm like, and I'm a family guy. I can't, I can't do that. I, I know it would hurt my, uh, relationship, uh, being away from the wife for that much time. Yeah, absolutely. And, realistically it's like it's not it's not that much fun it gets it's cool when you start doing the shows and it's great meeting people i love that but man like it is a grind maybe Uh, a couple strategic shows would be good yeah yeah and a lot of shows are just weekends but the the harrisburg show is like nine days and that's uh yeah so i mean i lose my voice after after like i'd say day three day four i believe it um i believe it yeah it's a lot of talking a lot of shouting (laughs) and is it pretty uh, noisy in those expo centers? <laughs> oh my god, man! I, if so, I think the Great American Outdoor Show in Harrisburg is one of the biggest shows the uh, in the country. So man. there's like millions of people that go to that. So just imagine how many people like bow hunting. Well, the the archery hall is full of all kinds of people. Mm-hmm. So, I can only imagine, man. Well, you, you know, one of these days, well. you know, I love the Mobile Hunter Road Show. I do want to go to the Mobile Hunters Expo this year. Just because I know that I think yeah. I would get a kick out of a lot of, a lot of the products that are there, just kind of yeah. and shaking yeah. hands with people too is cool. But uh, right, I don't know if right. I'm ready there, to make. You trips. know, I'm gonna I'm gonna come out and say something about it. There's a lot of like this like weird stigma about the expo versus the road show. Like yeah, some kind of battle. I heard that this year. Um, it you know honestly like I don't know where it all stemmed from. Uh, but it, I mean it's all like it it's supposed to be a community, right? Yeah, like why. I don't understand the division. Um, and I know it's not anything I can tell you personally from the people I know that have started the mobile road show and they don't, they don't care. I, I, I think, I don't know where it all got started that there's like a pissing match about like, you know, this show is better than that show or, Oh, that's a little show. It's like, dude, both of the shows have killer turnouts. There's killer information to be learned. In my opinion, I would say, the road show is more tailored now to more education. hundred uh, percent. And, and the expo I've been to is more of like a small, like a deer classic or something like, but it's full of the mobile hunting, you know, companies, which right. is great. So it, it's cool, but I feel like you couldn't, you wouldn't want to spend, you couldn't spend like as much. It's not as intuitive. It's not as interactive as a road show. Right. Uh, it, there's no way. Now um, you said it on your last episode. Being biased, you said it on that? your last episode, dude. Ten years ago, you wouldn't know what your neighbor shot. Yeah, I think social media inherently drives a wedge between what would otherwise be a tight tight knit community, and it happens because people love conflict. Yeah. People love it; they get off on it. Like I can see it on the Mobile Hunters United facebook page like there are dudes that cannot sit on their couch at night and just watch tv and scroll they have to talk shit they have to poke the bear and i i think it's it's because one dude has that obsession with starting shit and it starts as a whisper and it snowballs into where did this drama even start from and it was some random guy on his couch one night Social and media, the, baby. You and I both know, <laughs> like, I think you can look at it. Like, we we share the same mindset. You know, we follow each other online. Um, it really just stems down to, like, you won't ever see a successful person put somebody down. Never. Right? No. Because, like, we don't, number one, we don't have time for that. Right. And number two, like, 
I think every person that's good at anything like has some sort of at least a majority, they have some sort of like pass it on mentality, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you're worth a shit and and you want to learn about something and then I'm going to take the time to try and help you. If I, if I see that, you know, you have the want for it. Um, it's just, it's just animosity. There's, that's the one thing with hunting is, uh, there's, and I've learned from being not that I'm an industry guy, but like somewhat being a part of the industry, there's so many egos and just because somebody kills a Boone and Crockett or this or that, it's like, nobody really cares, man. Um, you know, are you having fun? Or in my opinion, it's like, are you a decent person? Yeah. Like, you know, I'm more of a, a personality kind of guy and there's a lot of really good people in the hunting community. And, and there's some of them that just walk around with their chin up in the air. And it's just, uh, it's just comical to me. Cause like, <laughs> You know, watch out for that door that jam. Per- yeah, <laughs> right. If you put that person in a room ten years ago, like we're talking about, like everybody in that place would probably be like, "Oh, there's there that dickhead." Yeah, oh, John or, or you know yeah. whatever his name is. Yeah, and uh, I I don't know, man. I just I love hunting. I've always loved it. It's it, this year's just uh been the the hardest year and the best year. Uh, that I've had, but well, let's come um, back to that. Why don't you thank? First of all, thank you for taking time out of your Monday to hang out with me and record a podcast. Not a lot of people can do that. I have a super flexible schedule. Apparently, your Mondays are good in the middle of the day as well. Um, why don't you take a second and just introduce yourself? And then, unlike a lot of people and like myself, I want you to tell people where they can get in touch with you in the front end of the podcast, because I know a lot of people never make it to the end of the podcast. I got you. I got you. Try that. Well, Brett, thank you. Thank yeah, you man. for having me on, man. Um, I appreciate you. Uh, you're, you're a great dude, too. I've listened to a couple episodes. Um, and I mean, for me personally, like I've just man, I don't listen to as much podcast anymore because I'm not on the road so much. Um, I've got a very flexible schedule. I do handyman work. Um, and I do a little bit of HVAC work here and there, but a lot of times where I live at, I'm in Western Kentucky and, uh, we're kind of in like a, a lake area. So in the summertime, I'm very busy, which is great. Um, but the wintertime and the fall, it's, it tends to slow down a bit. So I'm very fortunate. I've got a couple kids. I've got a great wife. Um, she works from home as well. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's great for me to be able to have, you know, my wife be able to understand my passion and let me go out in the woods as much as I do. And, uh, I, I do hunt quite a bit. I have been a dedicated, uh, I'd say a hardcore bow hunter for probably, uh, t- 12 to 13 years now. Um, I've hunted my whole life since I was like 12, I'm 34 now. Um, I've really, I grew up in Maryland, uh, on the East coast and I moved to Western Kentucky in pursuit of bigger deer and just to escape the rat race. Uh, I've always been a, a big supporter and, uh, chasing your dreams and, you know, going somewhere that makes you happy and, uh, and living your life for yourself. I mean, you're, uh, you're not a tree, uh, if you guys are listening and, you know, you're in an area like Michigan, like Brett or wherever you're at, and maybe you're not around big deer. Man, if, if you got the opportunity and, and you got a supportive wife or you're single, go go chase it, man. If you I mean, there's tons of guys that love hunting and uh I can tell you sometimes the grass is greener on the other side. So uh, you know, you you only got one life to live and it's short. Um so with without getting too deep and going down rabbit holes, uh, that's just me, my personality, and um I'm mostly a bow hunter. I'm not against gun hunting, but I've just gotten to the point, um, where I'm at, where I just really enjoy taking deer with a bow. And that's, that's pretty much it, man. Um, other than that, just, I got a, a my first elk this year. Um, yeah, you did. It's been a, a, a huge dream of mine and was very fortunate. And I killed a nice, uh, six by elk and yeah. If you guys, uh, are, don't know about me, uh, my name is Justin Sinan. You can find me on, uh, Instagram at Justin underscore Sinan. And, uh, I also have a podcast for mobile hunting called the running and gunning podcast. Um, check us out on Instagram. Uh, but yeah, man, I and appreciate a great follow, a great follow. Um, you are a very approachable guy. 
Uh, the content is excellent um, and consistent. And you and I, you know, I, I kind of went out of my comfort zone and asked for help in certain areas over the last couple of years, once I realized I wanted to get into more, being a more mobile hunter. And you are one of the people who has been always uh, approachable and and willing to have discussions and, and offer some suggestions. And for that, I thank you. And so I appreciate you coming on today, man. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, and I, I love that, man. I love uh, just being able to help people. That's, that's really what it's all about. It's a great community. And I know for myself, when I first got into mobile hunting, it's it, it it sounds sexy until you start climbing a tree <laughs> and uh, then uh, you kind of get into the bread and butter of things and, and it becomes a, uh, you, you can really see the advantages, but it's, it's kind of difficult at first until you get a groove for things. Yeah. A hundred percent agree with that. I, I don't think, you know, everybody talks about shooting their bow every day, but there is a different level of practice that is required when you decide you want to be a mobile hunter, whether that be a, a, a mobile hang on stand a platform and a saddle and all of the gear and staging and setup and tear down that comes with uh, that process and how imperative it is that you practice. And I don't, nobody really talks about that. Well, maybe they do, but not as much as I think shooting your bow comes into play. Yeah. Yeah. I always try to tell everybody when you get a, a hang on stand or a saddle, whatever it may be, it's like get a system that works for you. Um, everybody's got their own things that they like to do or way to hunt and figure out a system that works for you. Practice, uh, with your setup at least three to five times before you decide you want to go hunt. Oh yeah. And just get a feel for where your sticks are going to be. And I think the biggest problem most guys have is being able to climb a tree in one swoop. Yeah. Um, yep. when you get started and it just seems like you've got, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that you're trying to get up a tree at one time. And it just seems like mission impossible. And you can watch somebody that's a veteran do it in like five minutes. And you're like, Oh, well, why can't I do that? It's like, and do it and do it and do it and do it again, because doing it in September when it's 65 degrees in the morning versus doing it in January when it's nine degrees in the morning or September when it's a hundred degrees in the morning is all different. They're all different, but knowing your system feeling confident in it, and then also knowing it, but being willing to adapt should you need to um, is critical. Not being so stuck in your ways, I think, is is humongous. And I've listened to a lot of guys say, hey, listen, I got this figured out, but I had to be adaptable because of X, Y, and Z. And then, of course, you, you, you could theoretically find success um, not being so stuck in your ways. But, you know, I think everybody gets on here and talks about their big bucks. And you certainly have quite the wall behind you. And I know that you are a big buck killer, but I want to learn a little bit more about Justin himself. Um, you know, you said you grew up in Maryland, which is interesting uh, because I too have some extended family from Maryland and uh, the Hills, uh, Lana Conning to be specific. I don't know if that means anything to you. It's a pretty small town. I guess like Western Maryland or what? Good question. I don't really know. Um, if it's mountainous, I would imagine so. Yeah, very would, mountainous. Um, everybody was a, was a, I don't know if this is unusual, but a coal work, a coal miner. Um, oh, yeah. My grandparents Definitely. grew up there. We still have some family there. And my brother and I have actually talked about what it would look like for us to go back to Maryland. So give me a little I'd taste of what, what hunting was like in Maryland before you decided to leave. So Maryland's like one of the, it is a cool state. Uh, it's a very liberal state. So that's part of why we moved. Um, not to get into politics or anything like that, but, uh, it's, it's different. It's very diverse. So you've got Western Maryland that is all mountainous. It basically conjoins with Western West Virginia. Um, and then when you get out of Western Maryland, you get into like kind of rolling Hills terrain and that's, where I grew up was basically like farm country. Um, and then it pretty much from me being a kid to me being an adult, uh, like it turned into farm country and then turned into neighborhoods, which I'm sure, you know, happens everywhere in the country. Um, and then if you get on the Eastern side, you get into the shore. So it's more flat and you've got really good soil, tons of ag and you've got the Bay. So you've got like, pretty much one of the, I think Maryland is in the top 10 because there is some mega giant bucks on the Eastern side of Maryland. But so where I was positioned, you could go three hours West 
or you could go three hours east. And that's pretty much where the prime, you know, habitat for big, big bucks was. And when I got started, my dad had a, uh, he had a farm that he had permission to hunt and it was probably like a hundred acres on the Eastern shore. And I just started off there just killing deer, man. I was a numbers. I, I just was a meat hunter. We love shooting deer. Um, at age 12, I started and, and whacked all kinds of deer. And then I got into bow hunting around 18, uh, you know, 16 to 18. I always shot a bow as a kid, but my dad was really, really like, you know, strict about like, man, if you can't make a good shot at 20 yards and consistent, then I'm not going to let you go, you know, hunting a deer. And, and he was absolutely right. It was like, you know, I don't like to wound animals or we're, we're not out there. I was, I was raised with good ethics. I'll say that uh, hats off to my dad. Well, it's nice that you say and, that um, because I am enforcing that currently with my son. He is 10. He is, he has a compound. Uh, he has a bear compound. It is adjustable up to like 50 some pounds. He th- should theoretically be able to shoot that for the next several years of his life, but he's mm-hmm. very inconsistent um, at 20 yards. And I was like, man, I want you to go hunting with me this fall, but you, until you put in the work and you tighten that group up, we can't, we can't bow hunt together. And I, right. I thought sometimes and, I feel like maybe I'm being too hard on him. No, no. I think, I think you just, you need to have your, you know, your way set, man. Um, look, you're, you, you can take any adult. I, I know plenty of people that are, you know, just getting into bow hunting and they can't fathom. They can't understand what they're doing wrong. Sure. And we all go through it. You put your pin on a deer and you send an arrow and you, you know, you wound it or miss it or whatever. Sure. There's a, there's, there's a, some, some sense of maturity and I'm, I'm not acting for any of you dads out there and your kids have killed deer with a bow and they're, you know, 10 or 13. Like that's absolutely awesome. And hats off to you. Um, but just, you know, for me, I, I think I agree with what my dad did. Even when I was 16 and 18, I was still making mistakes like that, you know, yeah, and, and sure. shooting deer and getting excited. I mean, let's be real. That's that's what hunting's about, right? It still happens today. I mean, yeah. So I got into that. We lost the property on the Eastern Shore. And my dad, like, lost taste of, like, he wanted to be a trophy hunter, right? Like, he went out of the, the you know, meat hunter stage. He killed a, a real nice, like, mid-140s, uh, 10. And you could consistently kill mature deer on this property. And he was the only guy bow hunting. So he had a bad taste. I was, and I'm hopping all over the place, but it's going to come full circle in a minute. So I was dating a girl at the time. I'm like 18, um, 19. And I'm at her house and I had a dirt bike in the back and I like, whatever she, she had something going on. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for a ride and I'll be back. I went for a ride in the woods by her house and she lived in a suburban area. I came across like four deer that were Pope and young. And I was just like, Oh my God, like what, you know, I couldn't believe what I had seen. I'm like, I've, I've barely even seen a Pope and young deer like in my life, maybe a couple of times. Yeah. And, uh, I'm like, this is insane. So I started, you know, I got permission from her neighbor, started hunting, Um, missed a a giant buck on the ground. I just strictly hunted deer on the ground and in a climber. And that was where I started. Uh, I was, I always mobile hunted my dad and I both, uh, hunted out of climbers and that's how we got started. And then, uh, it was just a snowball effect, man. I was hooked. I killed a, a 160, uh, the second like hardcore year, I would say of, uh, my bow hunting career. And, um, it was in a suburban area, man. It was a giant and I was incredible. Hooked. I mean, I well, killed another. Now, hold on. Spell this out for Go me. Ahead. What, what was it that hooked? Was it the deer itself? Was it your ability to shape shift yourself in your environment to be where you needed to be? What was it that hooked you? Do you know? Um, I, I can tell you right, right away. It was the constant failure. I went through the year prior to this. Um, when I found suburban hunting, I had failure after failure after failure. I figured out how to get within range of these big bucks, but I, I was a shitty shot with my bow. Mm. I was not a, a proficient bow hunter. So I took that whole season, that off season, knowing what I had learned, uh, I got more permission and then I got really, really good. I honed in on my bow. I was a single guy at the time. 
I had endless time. So I got into indoor archery. Uh, I started shooting, you know, paper all winter and dude, I was a machine. Like, is this about 15 years ago? Uh, this is 12 years ago. Okay. 12 years ago. Got it. Yeah. So like, you know, I'd been bow hunting for like 14, 15 years and it took me a few years, uh, you know, where I had that transformation stage, I guess, if you want to call it from being a meat hunter to passing good bucks to, cause I understood like, Hey, there's a deer I would normally shoot back, you know, in, in the back 40 in the woods by the house, but I know what's in here. Cause I, I, you know, especially during the rut, dude, like there's some mega giant deer running around this place. Amazing. And I was just, this is before seek one. And this is before yeah. the, the glorification of, you know, suburban hunting. And, um, it was, dude, it was a good time to be in the woods. Let's that's sort that. of, that's what I was getting at is, is when was this in the, you know, the sequence of, like you said, seek one and the internet mm-hmm. and, and how yeah. maybe getting permission was different this many years ago it, versus today it was, and all that. I was, was trying to feel that different. out. Yeah. Yeah. It was very different, man. It, it was really a, a great time for me to get into it. Cause I was doing stuff. One of my favorite quotes is, uh, you know, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. Mm-hmm. And I always tried to push the boundaries and push myself every year. So when, and I actually, before I killed the, the one sixty, I'd killed, my first Pope and young. And it was like a one twenty six or something. I don't, I didn't even like score him for years and years, but, uh, he was a great deer. So he was my first legit good buck with a bow. And then two weeks later I killed this one and I was just like, Oh, I'm on fire. Here we go, and, baby. <laughs> yeah. And it was just, it was on from there, man. Yeah. So that's incredible. So, so interestingly enough, I, I have this question that I, and I just talked to, um, uh, Matt, who was a previous guest on the show, he has the Mobile Hunter Dojo um, mm-hmm. podcast. Um, he killed a 200 inch deer this year in Illinois. Yeah, and um, and I asked him the same question. Um, do you did you at the time realize that you had skipped, or maybe you don't even look at it this way? You had skipped sort of this tiered level of a of achievement where you, you sort of shoot bigger deer incrementally over time. Instead, you went from shooting a fantastic deer to a fucking giant. Did it, did it seem yeah. weird to you that you made that huge jump um, so quickly? Uh, yes and no. I think it all like, and here's where just like, I think Matt would agree with me when I'm saying this, you know, and you know this and most people that are going to hear this know it. Uh, you can't kill big deer where they're not at. Um, I was in a good area where there's several big deer and it was just, you know, it doesn't matter where you're at in the country, man. Like if you want to kill something big, like you're not going to do it if you're not hunting where they, they aren't. Okay? Let me ask you this. What was this your four cameras? This is oh, before, interesting. This was yeah. purely just hunting and knowing an area and hunting it. Like I didn't run cameras. I wasn't big on social media. I just hunted. I, I hunted my ass off anytime I could. And I got good at, at reading the woods. So it was just kind of, yeah, I, I didn't really like, I wouldn't say I skipped a bunch of levels. It was just like time finally caught up and I was, okay. and I killed a good deer for my area. Now a 160 in Maryland's like a 180 or 190 in Illinois. Right. Um, so, I mean, there are just not many of them around, dude. Uh, what? but yeah, it, it, it did take me, <laughs> let's say nine to 10 years before I killed another 160. So what was your, what was your circle of influence like, um, at that time in Maryland, when you shoot a 160 in a relatively suburban area, what was your friend group? Like, what was your, who were your mentors and and how did you guys talk about hunting at that point in your career? I had no mentors. Interesting. I was purely self-taught. Nobody. And I'm not saying that to brag at all. I, I just didn't, I was doing stuff. A lot of my friends, and I'm not going to act like I didn't party, um, but I was the guy that was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm done drinking. I'm going to I'm gonna hunt in the morning. And they're like, oh, oh, oh you always hunt. It's like, yeah, uh, that's like yep, what I sure like do. do. <laughs> so that was just me, dude. I, I don't know. I'm a, I have an obsessive personality, and being a single guy at that time in my life, wanting to get after big deer, like, 
if if I had a, an encounter with you, you were, I don't know, I wouldn't say you were in trouble, but I was coming for you. I was knocking on the tail of a lot of good deer at that time. It was just a good area. Um, it, if you put the time in, you were going to kill. And we had three buck tags at the time in Maryland. So it was like I could hunt from September all the way to the end of January. And a lot of years I'd kill three bucks. So have you ever, just, have you ever thought about what you just told me about how you didn't have mentors and you didn't really have a circle of influence? Do you, and the reason I ask that is because I did, and I, I always did. Um, it, I, I did not grow up in a hunting family per se. My dad did some pheasant hunting, some duck hunting, some goose hunting, but never deer hunted as a kid. Yeah. I didn't start deer, deer hunting until I was 21 because people that I worked with did. And then I took a 13 year hiatus when I lived in Florida and didn't pick back up till 2017. But at that point, as an adult man, I only had a circle of influence to realistically teach me how to hunt again. Nobody ever did. And so if you look back now and think about what it might have been like to have people whispering in your ear or making suggestions, do you feel like it could have taken you down a whole other path? Um. Yeah, or are maybe. you are you the type of person that inherently is going to do it his own way no matter what? I mean, it would have been nice to have uh, mentors. There was a couple older guys after doing it for a while that I you, you create enemies pretty quick too. Your name gets around. How that unfortunate you're killing is that? giants every year. Yeah, I mean, I had people that like follow my truck, man. I had people like. Oh yeah. I saw you were over here off a blah, blah road. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well I've got like 13 hunting spots, dude. So good luck. Like, yeah. You know, I mean, once, once I really, I would honestly say I was a lot better hunter when I was younger. I, uh, it's almost, I try to tell a lot of people now it's like, you know, you have a information overload or, um, analysis paralysis where you know too much shit, man. Like you're too scared to make a move because of, oh well oh I heard this oh I heard that like back then I just did it and yep. it's like okay well that didn't work well oh well, this worked here let me you know it I just I was very fortunate um my dad thought I was crazy man like he was kind of my mentor and then I surpassed him when I killed when I it, it hit me when I killed my first like big one and my dad was like oh shit like <laughs> man like. And I was like, dude, I'm telling you, I've missed deer way bigger than that. Wow. Like I missed a for sure booner, probably two. I think I missed two booners when I was younger. So that's what I was after, man. I was like, I mean, here I go from, sh you know, being happy with shooting a 120 to chasing 150s and 170s, uh, you know, in suburban. And I, I can barely find a, a Boone and Crockett here in Kentucky. You know what I mean? Like I was, it's, it's just different. Um, yeah. It's all relative, but hunting's hunting, man. Like it's mm -hmm. not like the deer are gonna do something totally different because technology changed. You know this this year. It's like right, and, were, were and you, I like seeing more and more people get back to the roots. I feel like oh, yeah. I noticed more and more people are trying to get away from using cameras or using them. I don't care. I mean, I use cell cams. I I, uh, you know, I, I use them. I really years. deployed a lot in my out of state stuff this year. Um, but our in-state stuff, like we only have, I say we, there is one property that three of our, four of us hunt that we just know. And so I said, we don't, I don't need to pay. We don't, no one's, I mean, if they listen to this, they're going to be mad at me, but whatever. No one's going to give me money to pay me for these cell cameras. We already know it. So we'll leave one on just for inventory purposes. And I'm going to turn them all off as soon as it's hunting season. And I don't feel like that was a hindrance to us. Like, hell, the, the property is the property. But the cell cams that I did put out in Illinois, um, I feel like paid me dividends this year. And I and it's and again, there are people that will judge me based on that. But it's it was six. It's a six and a half hour drive. It, but yeah, well, a single way. Yeah, and so right. I can't just go pull SD cards all the time. Number one, just, I mean, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do, but stop giving a crap what anybody says. Dude. Uh, yeah, no I do. What I do. You do. Yeah. But no matter what you do and, and like for hunting, somebody's going to bitch about oh, it. Oh, so 100%. Like, yes. Who gives a grat's ass? I mean, right. I've got cell cams that are 40 minutes away. I yeah. could go check them. Sure. But like for, I don't know. I don't have time, man. If yeah. you're 
if you're a working guy and, and some guys might say I've got way more time than other people, but you know, I'm yep. a dad, I'm a, I have a business, yep. I'm, you know, trying to hunt several properties, you know, yeah. it is what it is. I don't care. It's technology. It's legal. I don't really use bait. Right. Um, but you could, I, I, you could I, though, right? I could. Yeah. That's I could. what I thought. A lot of people, I wasn't sure. Yeah. And I will put corn out, but it's, I don't enjoy hunting over corn. Right. I, if I put corn out, a, a lot of times it's just for inventory purposes to, try to keep deer over here if it's rifle season instead of all my sure. neighbors. I mean, cause you, you do have to use corn a lot of times if you want to hold deer on a property. hundred percent. Unfortunately, um, it's, it's the reality of the situation. People I think I really think that was a hindrance for me in Kansas this year is because the Weeha that I found had neighbors that baited it's just the way it goes. You can bait on private, yep. but you can't on public. And so as soon as the natural, I say natural food, as soon as the the crops were gone, so beans, corn, milo, as soon as it's gone, those deer, if you don't catch them passing through the weeha that you happen to find to go onto a neighbor's corn feeder, you're fucked. They're, they're, yeah. are just, they're just gone. And so I went back super late season right after Christmas and I couldn't figure it out, man. Just, just because, and I think it's because neighbors are running corn. Good for them. They, they should. And I just couldn't, I couldn't find the natural food or browse for them. But, you know, I wanted to ask you back then when you were in Maryland and you were suburban hunting and you were shooting big deer and you were seeing big deer, were you, were you consuming content to educate yourself or were you just no. figuring it out on the fly? I was just, just hunting, man. Son just of walking a guy. in. This and- guy here. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, dude, I love it. It's kind of, it's, awesome. it's kind of cool. I mean, you make me feel good about it, but yeah, no, I mean, I don't know what it, does nobody do that anymore. Well, here's I mean, here's I, how I, here's I think how I'm looking have at this. so much. So there's so much more now. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong, Brett. Cause that's kind of bullshit. Cause I would, I would, uh, read magazines. I was more of a, like a North American whitetail guy, Yeah, but it's not like I was over the top consumed with reading every article I could. It was just, if, sure. if I had time and I'm I'm sitting there not doing anything, I'd, I'd fan through. If I saw an article that I liked, I would check it out. So um, it, it's it's hard for me, be, and forgive me, but it's hard because I started it at 21. I took 13 years off. I didn't start again until I was in my, li- you know, my late 30s, pretty much. So yeah. I didn't – when I started, it was climber, so I was a mobile guy as well. Um, we were in state forests in northern Michigan – Never saw a deer. Now, I'm not kidding you. I don't think I ever saw a single deer when we did that. But I I didn't grow up in a time where I needed to learn anything. So I, I didn't grow up hunting in a time where I had to go figure things out. I basically yeah. I, I disappeared, quote unquote, for a, a period of time and came back and I wanted to go balls out as fast as possible. And the only way for me to do it at that time was to consume as much content as possible to try and maybe catch up. And so I think it's right. hard for me to even, f- com- you know, to comprehend what it would have been like growing up as a young man, learning to bow hunt and, re- and going through the process organically. And so that's why I keep asking. Yeah. I mean, realistically, man, like I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. I mean, I was hunting a suburban area. Um, it's a lot easier to funnel deer movement in an area where you can control deer movement yeah you know through houses or whatever the that's true cause might be um but one thing i focused on was uh i would find a cul-de-sac right like a neighborhood Mm -hmm. and i would search my biggest thing like for what i did my secret sauce if you want to call it was google maps we didn't have one x back then so what i did i if i had spare time i'd look on on x or look on uh, google maps i'm sorry and i would see what neighborhoods backed up to like a park area or like where could I find like a dead end? Right. And then I would go in there and I'd approach it like that. And I would scout and I would see where the deer trails are and I would hunt and I would adjust. And that's purely, that's all that mobile hunting is in a nutshell. It's like Mm -hmm. find sign, hunt, adjust, bam, repeat. And then until you find something. And then really once you figure an area out and you're like, all right, this is a dynamite spot. Well, I would watch for the right wind direction and I would hunt it like completely random on the right wind. And yeah. that's how that was my approach. I love it. And man. I love it. Yeah, that's good that's shit. It. In a nutshell. How, how hard is that? Right. 
Well, for a lot of people who aren't willing to do the work, that is just an unsurmountable task, Justin. How dare you yeah. require we do so much thinking and planning and working? Um, yeah, it, to me, it doesn't <laughs> seem like that much. But I mean, it's, you know, it is what it is. Like, you, you know, you get in what you put in. I oh, mean, my God. Yes. I'm going to ask you a palate cleanser of a question here, and then I'm going to change topics here. Does Justin Sinan have any superstitions as it relates to hunting? Uh, no. No, really. no was, song, no was, socks, no underwear, no long johns. No, I mean, I try to like switch up hats to just maybe think I have a lucky hat, but uh, that that seems to be, uh, I think I've worn out the possibility oh, no. this year. <laughs> but, I think you got to wear yeah, it I, while you shoot another one and re reinvigorate the luck. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would say I was born on Friday the 13th. So yeah, that I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of out of superstitions. It is what it is. Interesting. You don't know. Do you ever notice similarities that you could then play on? Like, Oh, it was 11, 11 when I saw this, like, and nothing. There's <laughs> I've just had, nothing. I've had good dates. I've killed a lot of deer between November 4th and November 5th. Those are uh, my favorite day. I could have killed a, a nice buck this year on November 5th, but I let him slide. Okay. Um, I've killed two of my Kentucky bucks and two bucks in Maryland on November 5th. Like, okay. So, and then I've killed a, another couple on November 4th, but I would have to, in my defense, I, I'm a, a very good rut hunter. I would say, um, I, I just tend to like find a buck and then prey on his weaknesses during that time frame. Okay. I just feel like most big deer are on their feet around there. So I agree with that. You know, there's a lot of people uh, that have a song a that they listen to on the way to their stand or, or you know, yeah. in the truck on their way to their you know, opening day or whatever. Um, just curious if you uh, had tequila. any of those. Tequila seems to be the lucky jam of the year. I've had like the Pee Wee Herman Big Adventure tequila. Da -da 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 -da. Yeah, yeah, the oh, old, hell like, yeah. original one, nice. the original. It's like I don't know, man. That's just vibes for me, dude. Uh, when I'm driving to the stand, I'm just like, I gotta tequila. Forgive me, but I gotta make a note of that. That is, uh, I gotta. Oh yeah, it's, I like that, dude. It, it, I've had, I had, I listened to it. I, I that I can think of off my head. I had three. Really good encounters with deer. I'm I messed up on a giant in Indiana, and me, my buddy Tyler, and uh, my other buddy Christian were all driving to the same farm together in the truck. And he's like, "What's your hunting jam?" And I'm like, "Tequila." And they all looked at me like, <laughs> "What in the hell?" And then like, and then they started it, and we're driving there, and they're like, "Okay, I get it. I get, I get it, it now." Right. Yeah. Do you do you visualize the Pee Wee Herman scene, or do you do no, you just get in the no. in the music? Honestly, you want to know what I envision? Please. Uh, sa Sandlot. Okay. Okay. I'm when on board with this. I'm on board yeah, with this. I don't know. I don't know. Unfor so so about I'm when they're like, <laughs> the jaw. So they, I know, got about 10 years on you. Um, and unfortunately, I envision Pee Wee Herman in his high top shoes, toe dancing across the bar in Pee Wee's Big Adventure. So if if that's what I was thinking about, I probably <laughs> wouldn't listen to it. But uh, no, nah, uh, dude, I'm a total random music person. I love classic rock. Okay. I listen listen to everything. I listen to rap. Um, nice. You know, heavy metal. It it just depends on my mood. If I'm angry at the deer, I'll I'll jam to some heavy metal on the way. I'm uh, not gonna lie, the tequila up. thing has been my favorite so far. Um, I love okay. it. I love it. Love it. Yeah. So transitioning yeah. into the, the another topic here. So since you are so like you are affiliated and, and I don't know how loosely or closely you are affiliated with Lone Wolf Custom, Custom Gear, but, you know, you are, would you consider yourself a mobile hunter like exclusively? Uh, I mean, pretty much. It's like the, I mean, there's a few, I kind of cheat a little bit if I'm hunting a farm. Um, I'll hang some sticks ahead of time. Yeah. I mean, and, that's, and I still consider I'm, that mobile. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always hanging a set, man. Yeah. Um, it is what it is. And I'm, I was very fortunate. Uh, I got hooked up with Lone Wolf like four years ago. Okay. Um, when I moved to Kentucky, I reached out to Justin Hollinsworth and I started filming for Whitetail Addictions. This will be the first year I don't have a video for him, and I'm not, I'm not trying to speak too soon. I still have like two more hunts in me, um, and I am on the heels of this son of a bitch, dude. Good. I'm telling you what, man, he freaking I bob he weaves. He's I've had four encounters with him. 
Uh, he is, he's putting it on and I'm, I'm having fun with it. I'm not really pissed off. I'm I can happy see it on your face. Season, yeah. If, if the season ends and I don't kill one, then this will be the first year in 11 years, uh, that I haven't or in 12 years. Yeah. Wow. So I've had a, a streak for the past 11 years. I've killed a Pope and young every year. Um, and I could have done it this year. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's not, right. I, it doesn't matter to me anymore. I don't care what people think or clout. I don't, sure. I got nothing to prove. Um, it's just, I wanted to kill something bigger and I had a bigger deer on the farm and he got killed during rifle season. So Ooh. now I'm trying to kill a buck that I could have killed really easy in early season, but now he's, he's putting on the work for me. So, uh, it's been fun. Good. Well, I, I can tell, I can, like I said, I can see it on your face that you are actually enjoying it. You don't look defeated. You look, you still look excited, which is nice. Yeah. It's a, it's a chess match, man. Good. Like it's, uh, it's fun. It's fun to me to have deer like this because they, they make it interesting. If I do kill him, I know how excited I'll be. And he's sure. not, I mean, he's probably a 140, maybe. Uh, he's just a really big eight. Yeah. Um, and and it's been a challenge to kill him. Um, That's I've part of the fun. I've come so close. Yeah, I've come so close uh, a few times, and it is what it is. If he wins, uh, I know where he's bedded. Hopefully, I can find his sheds. But it's been a real, real tough year, dude. Just between weather and not getting the winds that I need to be able to hunt him where I want to hunt him, and um, yeah, and him being lucky too. Yeah, like there was. A morning, me and the old lady were going out on a date that night, and I wanted to hunt this set in the morning. And I was like, eh, if I hunt, I'll be a worthless turd all night. So, and in sure shit, he comes through all by himself at 8.30, like, rolls right through this little, you know, transition zone that I had a camera on. And it's almost like they're hunting us. I I agree with you a lot. I mean, I don't know. It'd be it really be interesting to find out. You know, I, I'm sure he's cut my trail tons of times. I mean, I got a I got a buddy who's uh so my son plays hockey and one of the dads on the team is a huge hunter as well. Um, he's an absolute killer, but he's like I don't think he has social media. Like you would just never know it. And there's so many of these guys in this world right now. I love that. I love it yeah. too. And I want to have him on here one day. He's a killer, but he was hunting this absolute slammer. Uh, here in Michigan and the neighbor ended up shooting it, but he was like, if I go here, he's over there. If I go over there, he was where I was yesterday. And I'm like, dude, that yep. deer, that deer is watching you somewhere, somehow, somewhere yeah. that deer is watching you. Yeah. And I know Access that is everything, dude. Sure. I, it just, this farm that I'm hunting him on, like I'm so limited on access mm -hmm. and like there's times in the morning I can get it done, but there's so many does in there. They just, it's just a challenge. Yeah. Um, I've had fun, man. It, it's been a great year. I've had more encounters with mature deer and, and good bucks than I've ever had. Uh, it's just, it just, uh, I don't know. I haven't found a deer that I want to kill like in front of me at 20 yards. Or, That's important. You know, 30, man. So, Hey, what is your, yeah. what is your mobile go-to setup right now? Um, either the fix with three of the 14 inch doubles, or the 0.5 with three 17 inch doubles. I, I really prefer the double sticks. Um, you know, whatever your preference is, but I really like having both of my feet planted um, just in case something doesn't go right. Or I have to, I have a, a injury on my right leg. I broke my leg and my foot. So like if I'm standing there for a while, my right leg, it'll get, it cramps up easier than, you know, if it wasn't messed up. And do you use a so, harness or do you use a saddle? I use a saddle pretty much every time. The funniest thing, I don't know if you saw the video or I recently posted, but um, I took my hang on because I scoped out this spot. I scouted and I looked at the field edge and I looked at this tree and I'm like, all right, I can get right in that gap right there. And I brought my harness and my hang on stand, like my 0.75. And I get to the tree and dude, it is like crooked as a, dog stick. I mean, it is, it is bad. It's pretty extreme. And I'm like, there's no freaking way I'm going to be able to hunt like on the, you know, the downside of, yeah. of the tree, like in here. So I was like, all right, well, I'm going to set it up. And I hunted it like a saddle just from the backside of the tree. And, uh, I didn't see a deer. My, that was the night. So I've been trying to kill this buck in the field. And then I found all this sign back off of the field near a bedding area. So I hopped in there and hunted that. And then while I'm hunting, 
at 4:30. He's he's over in the field showing up where I haven't seen him in like weeks. So unreal. Unreal, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, hey, listen, the reason that I ask you that is because I have a I've been thinking about this for a while and I always think about this weird shit when I'm by myself and I have nothing else to think about. Or I'm not thinking about work or the kids are quiet. But if you think about, let's just say let me, I'm going to use this as an example, music consumption. So think back to like records and then eight tracks and then cassettes and then CDs and then MP3s and then, you know, the sort of the evolution of how you consume music. You know, mobile hunting yeah. is no different in that it went from point A to wherever we are today in the evolution of mobile hunting. Maybe you don't ever think about it, but how do you see or do you see the evolution of mobile hunting, where does it go from here? I mean, not, we got so much amazing, cool mobile hunting gear right now. Where are we going? Um, in my opinion, yeah. and from talking with a lot of innovators in the mobile hunting community and space, I, I kind of think the only thing you're going to see different is like you, you'll see. I, I don't think that the carbon, the carbon needs some improvement. But I don't really see the added benefit of it. I, I just don't. Um, it's cool that we're doing that stuff, but it's noisier. Um, it's not as like strong in the cold temperatures. Um, I think that you'll see a lot of cool, like smaller gadgets uh, get made, and like you know. But realistically, like a saddle is a saddle. You can't. There's there's not that much more innovation you can put into a saddle than what we what we have, and hang ons are kind of at a pinnacle too. I mean, how much lighter can you get? You know, it it's you just see the same design copied over and over and over. Um, I think that you'll see like a few niche products come out, but they're going to be based off of similar designs. I don't I I just can't really see anything groundbreaking and completely different than what we have. You, you know what I'm saying? I totally agree, but I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Okay. I think the same thing was said about every one of those evolutions of musical consumption as well. Okay. You know what I mean? I agree with you on that. And, and I, I but it just, it hurts my brain when I try to come up. Cause I like thinking about the future and where, where can we go and how can I be included in this? Or how can I be involved in the evolution? Oh, of course. And then yeah, you're like, I've I don't know, man, to make a, yeah. make some kind of product. So I I'd can, love it. You know, I love that yeah. people are three, three D printing stuff. I love right. how light and compact everything is, but, and I, I'm, I share the same sentiments with you. At what point have we maxed out? And then right. do we go back? Cause you know, retro is cool, man. Like oh, records yeah. are cool well, again. That's, <laughs> that's where like, and seeing everybody talk crap on the saddles when they first came out. Oh, it's a fad. Oh, it's, it's this and that. And now, you still see a strong number of people gravitating to the saddle yeah. and you see a lot of people that are going from saddle back to the tree stand. And yeah. like the, the realism that I think people try to put a, a pin on what their, what their system is or what mobile hunting is or whatever it is, dude, all these things are just tools in your arsenal. hundred percent. Like it, that's all it is. What, what do you need to do to get it done? You don't, you don't need a stand. You just need to fucking time. be out I mean, there. Hell, Right. Yeah. I can kill a deer off the ground. Like how much more mobile do you want to get? Um, it's, it's all just efficiency. What, what can save you time and save you hassle? And that's really, that's where you'll see like products coming out and ingenuity. And I mean, realistically, what's the next thing we're going to have? We have a hoverboard that we can just connect to a tree and shoot up a tree. <laughs> that would be cool. I'd be down. So my that. brother, my brother who is very new into hunting, he's only been doing it for a few years. Um, so I talked him into going to Kansas with me this year, but I was like, listen, man, you need to put this stand on your back and I need you to hike around town and then hang that bitch because it ain't just walking 150 yards out to a preset and walk, climbing up that ladder and sitting down. Like, yeah. So he was like, we need to invent a teleportation device to take me from the car <laughs> to the stand I want to go to as he's huffing and puffing after hiking back to the truck in Kansas. And I was like, that's it. We need yeah. a teleportation device. Work yeah. on that. Dude, and, and you know this as well as I do. Uh, I think fitness does play a part. I'm not telling everybody out there that you need to be, you know, ripped and jacked and, you know, be Cam Haynes. But make sure you have somewhat of a cardio and make sure – 
that you, I think rucks are a great thing uh, yes. for, for mobile hunting. I think it's, I, I didn't, uh, I approached to hunting a lot different this year from doing my elk hunt because it put me in such a better physical shape than I've ever been. Yeah. But you know, honestly, man, sometimes like it's good to get around, but like, you know, if you don't have the skill set, like you don't have the skill set. Like you, I think knowledge is more powerful than anything. Um, you got to learn and you got to, you have to put yourself through it. Like, you can listen to anything you hear on a podcast, but you won't be able to apply it if you're not able to to pull it off. Let me you know what I mean. So I, I have know what you're looking at. I was going to ask you a closing question, but I think you just answered it for me. And I, and forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth here, but would you say that the number one uh, piece of gear or tool that you have in your arsenal is what's in your head based on your woodsmanship? Yeah, so, I agree with you. I was going to ask you what that one piece of gear is that you can't live without. Constantly questioning yeah. that tool all the time. Yeah. So, but you're also yeah. constantly learning and reading the woods and taking right. your most recent info and digesting it and regurgitating it into another plan. But I think you and I, I agree with you because I don't. I never thought about it that way until you just said this. But I think the number one tool that anybody can put in their tool belt is woodsmanship. Right. Time in the woods. Time in the woods. There's, there's, no there's substitute nothing for well, yeah. There, and that, and I think a lot of other people like that. Yeah, you want to shoot a 150, but have you ever had a 130 inch deer or a 120 inch deer come in? Like, do you that, even know that what happened that to looks me? Like, yeah. My and, biggest and, and, deer is this 116. He's a 116 right here. Yeah. And then I shoot what a about, one. And then I shoot a 162 shoot? this year. I was gonna. Say, <laughs> I went shot from a giant. Yeah. <laughs> I've never seen a 120. <laughs> Or a 130 or a 140. I went from this being the biggest deer I ever shot to a fucking 160, but I somehow was able to not look at his antlers. Just I was cool the whole time. But it's like yeah. you said, <laughs> have yeah, you man. ever? No, I you, haven't. It was weird. <laughs> you, you really won't know. Like I went through, uh, I want to say it was probably on year four or year five um, of hunting. And I went through a really bad phase, man. Every single time I would watch a mature deer and I would see it from a distance and have it come to me, I would wig out. Yeah. I think that's whole, I think that's pretty normal pain. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, yeah, I couldn't understand. And I, and I, I whiffed it on like three great deer and I finally like just beat the hell out of myself. Like, like, what are you doing? And I, I finally got control of it, but dude, like there's a, I don't, I don't, you know, I guess you could call it buck fever, but I basically, instead of shaking, I would get this pain. I'd, I'd squeeze my core so tight. Like I was so nervous. I didn't even know how to control it. And it would like, it would hurt. Like my, my stomach would hurt so bad. Damn. And then I finally, I don't, and I've talked to a lot of other guys of like, have you ever had that? Like, and they were like, what? Like on the beginning. And I'm like, man, like after it was really like after I, shot a couple, you know, and I feel like maybe it was cause it was just bad luck. I had a deer like drop my arrow. That was one bad thing. And then I missed another one. And then like, I had that feeling of like, Oh man, am I going to miss? And like, you got to have it in your head. It's like, Hey man, slow it down and yeah. make a good shot. Slow it down, make a good sure. shot, whatever, whatever you need to tell yourself. Like, and then eventually you'll go from that to just it, you go into kill mode is what I call it. And it goes back to having confidence in yourself as a hunter, your skills, your your technique, your shot execution, and knowing your system. Basically, did you do the work to get to to really be able to pull this off? And if you know in your soul that I did, I've done everything in my power, then it's out of your hands, man. You just got to execute because out of, you know, sheer routine, drawback, right. anchor. Yeah. And I mean, like, and reading deer body language, I oh, mean, yeah. that's an art in itself that a lot, you know, that's where we just get back to what you had said earlier with like having time in the woods and what's the most important thing, man, like putting yourself around bigger deer is the most important thing. If you want to kill big deer, you gotta, there, there's no, uh, you know, just like anything you want to run a marathon. Well, you need to go run, you know, a couple five K's or 10 K's. Um, yep. it, it is what it is. Like you can't, you're not just going to get something you, you might, you might get lucky, but it won't be a consistency thing. Nope. I can promise you that. 
hundred percent agree, man. Well, listen, if we had, so since we are going to utilize woodsmanship as the single tool that you feel like is the most valuable one in your arsenal, do you have a physical tangible tool that you take into the woods with you that you have found to be the most useful, multi-purpose, got to have it at all times piece of gear that you bring with you every time? Uh, boots. Boots. So so good <laughs> boots or just your boots? No, uh, dude, it, it really doesn't. There's no magic tool, man. Um, I don't know. It's just not magic just necessarily. A, just the one thing that you've yeah. either said, man, I've used this way more than I realized or this was a flippant um, purchase and I just I feel like it's been super beneficial to me. Not really, man. I mean, I, I would say just really like anytime I'm going out, it's just really just having that mindset of it's a, it's a year long process. I mean, um, it's something that I think about pretty much every day. Uh, if you want to, if you want to cross over into, you know, the obsession of whitetail hunting, I mean, that's just being in the woods as much as you can. I love shed hunting. Um, I love Turkey hunting, just being in the woods, man. Um, Whatever it is, there's there's no real tool that I bring with me all the time. I mean, I'm I'm just out there a lot. So you have said guess, it, you said it twice. It's all up here, man. Yeah. It's experiences, it's knowledge, it's it's woodsmanship. It's that is your number one tool. Yeah, and I, I just want more people to to get that, you know? Like I don't think there's any greater feeling as a as a person and an outdoorsman and a woodsman, like, you know. It, it's really it's different like you're like the apex predator in the woods you know what i mean and, and you're also closer to nature than most people ever get like how many sunrises and sunsets and like s- stuff that we get to experience that nobody else gets to experience and it's you hard know, to like, explain that to someone who's never done it they don't yeah, get it yeah without trying to get all philosophical and yeah. stuff like that but but that's it's the truth man um yep. I, f- I feel like I'm very blessed to be able to, to just be in the woods, man. If you think about some of these people in like England or Europe, like, you know, you have to be royalty to be able to hunt. So I, I mean, I feel like we should all be happy and, you know, like I, I said it uh, on a story, less bitching, more hunting. Um, just, you know, just go have fun and, and um, make it more about having fun than, you know, whatever your personal, uh, interests are or something. I mean, it's like, enjoy yourself. It doesn't have to be an agenda. You don't have to have an agenda on social media. Enjoy it, man. And you know what? It's, it's up to us. People who are passionate like you and I, and so many other people that we both are interact with on a daily basis on Instagram or whatever. So social media, it is up to us to preserve this for future generations because there is a a tremendous population of people who could not possibly care any less about this. And if we don't fight for it and do what's right and ensure that it's here for future generations, it will be gone. And like you said, you'll have to be fucking royalty to go out in the yeah. woods and hunt. And I cannot imagine a world like that where my kids or grandkids would have to grow up. And right. What better way to, you know, not only provide for yourself uh, and your family with some quality meat, uh, but you know, it's it's just a it's a great thing, man. I mean, yep. you like we had mentioned with teaching your kids ethics. You know, it's like, hey, you're teaching your son that he needs to work hard to get to do something that he wants to do. You know, there's I, I always loved how many life lessons you can learn from the outdoors. I feel like anything you're passionate about, you can relate life lessons to. But you better believe it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I appreciate it, man. Well, listen, I'm gonna be conscious of your time i've kept you much longer probably than you anticipated but man i appreciate you sitting down with me on a monday afternoon to uh record a podcast with me it was nice to finally meet you uh absolutely or speak man with you. no uh, i yeah i appreciate you and uh it's been a blast dude i, I always love uh I've, I've had a great time on here with you cool. so well thanks man it's Thank nice to get to know you on. at a, d- a deeper level than just the big absolutely. buck killer <laughs> and well thank you sir and i, I know appreciate that you and I do, and everybody else wishes you. If you said you got two more hunts in you, man, we wish you good luck um, to Thank seal you, the sir. deal on whatever deer you choose to shoot this year. And uh, I know we'll be following along, and people can follow Absolutely. you uh, follow along with you at the Running and Gunning podcast and on yep. Instagram as well. Well, thanks, Justin. I appreciate it, man. All right, Brett. Have a good one, man. Yeah, man. You too. We'll talk to you later. All right. See ya.